And just like that, we are back. What's up, everybody? If you're watching this live, what's up to you? If you're watching the replay, what's up to you? I know a lot of people are like, Lethe, what's, what's going on, sis? I see, see, look at this. Look at this. What's going on? What's going on? See, what's going on? What's good? What's good? What is good? What is good? I feel like I, I, I feel like this is a family reunion almost. Doesn't it feel like this? Oh, look. And my man Ron is here. So if Ron is here, oh, my sis, my sis is here. If if Ron, just like that, we are back. Oh, I see Jennifer. Oh, I see Anna. Oh, 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 Michael, what's going on? Uh oh, we got your brill. Uh oh, ladies, watch out. We got your brill in the house. We got your brill in the house. Just like that, we are back. What's going on, good people? This is my man. Look at this. My man, Evan, giving good energy. What's on? What's going on, good people? Carlos, I see you. Uh oh, my man, Shane. My man, Shane, can I say something real quick? I, I always have to call folks out. It's interesting. We like to call people out when they do bad things, but it's important that we celebrate when people are doing things that we respect. I was shooting messages back and forth with Shane and Shane told me he was taking his wife out on a date. And two or three days ago, he was he messaged me. I think he was he was he was doing something with, with one of his kids. I love that. I love that. I love to see family. I love to see husbands taking care of their wives. I love to see husbands taking their wives out on dates. So big up to my man, Shane. Big up to my man, Shane. So here's what we're doing. Here's what we are doing today is if you have watched Better With Paul over the last four months, I think, I think it's been about four months, you know that I've been, I've come live a lot, two to three times a week. And then I stopped and this is four weeks later, and I'm coming back to you live. But my commitment four weeks ago was that I would periodically show up when I had something important to, to, to share, right? And also, so you know, is I also share things that are important through the Better With Paul podcast, which by the way, can I brag real quick? Can I brag? Can I? Let me just brag real quick. Let me just brag real quick is because of y'all, do you know Better With Paul podcast? We're only four weeks old. We are top 100 in over 50 countries. So this is on Spotify and on Apple in the self-improvement category. We are top 100 over 50 countries. And in 30 countries, we're top 20, right? So places like the UK, right? Um, Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica, Trinidad, TNT, like we are top 20 in those countries. And by the way, the reason why I'm so happy about that is because that's exactly what we wanted to do is in the podcast, what I've been doing is I've been showcasing what I consider to be incredible voices from West Africa, from the Caribbean, from the United States, from the UK. Voices that I believe don't get the recognition that they deserve on the big platforms. And, and, and I wanna talk about that in a second, but all I'm gonna do today with you is I wanna, I wanna teach a little bit. Can I teach just for a little bit? Because I talked to my sis yesterday, uh, Tiffany the Bajanista Aliche, and, and she said something that, that really hit me in a positive way. And that is, is you know, she was saying that, you know, when you teach, you learn twice, right? So it's like you are, teaching it, but you're reinforcing the learning. And one of the things that I've realized since lockdown, right? I think lockdown and, and COVID has given a lot of us space to just really think is I finally, after 15 years, I figured out what I believe I'm world-class in and what I want to continue to become even better at. Drum roll. Real quick, actually, let me ask y'all. Let me ask y'all. Uh oh, I see my sister Sterling. Let me ask everybody, right? What do you believe? Because here, because this is something I, I passionately believe, right? I think that we all need to in life find our one thing. As Cal Newport wrote in the book, So Good They Can't Ignore You, he talked about how you need to find that one thing that's a cross section of different skills that make you so good that people can't ignore you. And what Cal writes in that book is that if you can become so good, at something that people can't ignore you, you'll have more autonomy 
right? Control over your over your free time. You'll have more impact and you'll have more wealth than you could ever imagine, right? So I want to ask you, if y'all know me, what do you think at least that I'm I won't even say world class at, but what do you think? What's something that I'm that you could see that I'm clearly on the road to becoming? Real quick, all right. My sis Latoya says you're a connector. Okay, all right. I'm I'm with that. I'm with that. La will she she said you're a networker and an amplifier. Okay, okay, all right. I'm with that. I'm with that. All right. Um. Uh, so uh. Oh no. Oh no. No one thinks I'm world class at anything. No, no. All right. What's what's going on? I see. I see. What's going on? I see people saying hi in there. What? Oh man. We got a celebrity in the building, y'all. We got a celebrity in the building. Celebrity, my man Kavan. We got a celebrity in the house, y'all. All right. Someone said Reese is a public speaker. All right. My man, Ricardo just said something. He said, You're a connector and a teacher. I'm going, this is the first time I've ever disclosed this, right, publicly. So I'm drawing my line in the sand. I'm drawing my line in the sand with, with everybody right now. The area that I'm dedicating my life to. And I realize I've really dedicated the last 10 years of this, of my life to this is, I'm dedicating my life to unpacking and teaching the lessons of entrepreneurs and thought leaders. That is it, full stop. Unpacking and teaching the lessons from entrepreneurs and thought leaders. That is exactly what I want to become best in class at doing, best in the world at doing. And when I talked to my sis, Tiffany, yesterday, she was talking about the importance of teaching as much as possible. And I teach in masterminds, I teach in 101, right? I teach, teach, teach. But this is now another opportunity for me to teach. So I'm going to keep trying to come on as, as much as possible to teach, to unpack and teach lessons that I'm pulling from thought leaders and entrepreneurs. All right. So is, is that okay? Can I do, can I do that with y'all? Can I do that? There you go. There you go. All right. There you go. All right. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right. My man <laughs> said, yes, you are. Sterling says, yes, yes. Yeah. So, th so this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of about getting a tattoo right here on my face to say world-class at unpacking and teaching the lessons of, and then on my neck, I'm going to have entrepreneurs and then it's going to scroll across and say in thought leaders. That's what I'm thinking about. Is is you think is that a good idea? All right, should I do that? Leave the, all right, hold on, leave to so yes. Should I do that? The, the, the tattoo on the face. That's what you think I should do. So is that is that good? All right, no, 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 no. Said no, no, no. Okay, no, no. I see some yeses. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Erica said no. What are you talking about? No, no. What do you think I should do? <laughs> Latoya said right. Jill will divorce you. She would. She, I think if I wrote that all on my face and my neck, but at least she'd know I'm, I'm world class, right? Um, all right. So let me share with you real quick what I want to focus on today. All right. This is, this is exactly what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on this right here. All right. Now, I'm curious how many of y'all have listened? to every episode of Better With Paul. I just wanna see who we're really rocking with. Not one, not two, not three episodes, but there's been four episodes. These are the four people that we focused on. How many of y'all have watched all four of the episodes, okay? Because now I'll know who I'm talking to. Now, let me just break down the people real quick because I think this is, this is going to blow your mind. This is going to blow your mind. And I want to talk about the difference in the voices, in the popular voices of white entrepreneurs and black entrepreneurs. I want to talk about this in a second. All right. All right. I see, I see a lot of folks who, 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 there you go. I see a lot of folks. Good. I see a lot of folks who have listened to all the episodes, which is good. All right. So now this is what I want to say real quick is if you look at this photo, You'll see Lovey, Carl, Loco, right? Nana Kwame Bediako, and you'll see Neville Garrick. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, I believe that each of these folks are world class in their respective industries. And let me break down what I consider to be world class. I believe you are world class 
when you are at the top 1% of your industry, all right? So if, if, you, if, if you are in PR, right? Or you're in, you know, you're a TV presenter or you're a business coach, right? Whatever it is that you do, if you were to line up every single person who does what you do in the world and you are in the top 1% of doing that, I think you're world-class, right? That's, that's, that's my opinion. I'd be, I'm, I'm actually interested to see what you think. All right, my sister Ra Raquel agrees with that. I'm interested to see what you think is world-class, right? But that's what I believe. All right, Roder all right, my man Roderick, he, he agrees with that too. There you go. If you are top 1% in the industry, right? I think, okay, you're, you're world-class. Now, what's interesting to me about these, about these folks is that Lovey, Carl, Nana, and Neville, in my opinion, they're completely different. I think they're completely different. Now, I think there's a lot of people looking at this and they said, no, 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 no. They're the same, right? No, no, no. They are completely different. Different countries are represented. You've got Nigeria represented in there. You've got Ghana represented in there. You have Jamaica represented in there. You have the UK represented in there. You have different countries, right, represented. You have different industries. Lovey really made her bones in the publishing industry. She actually has changed public. And, and this is like no exaggeration. L because of Lovey, Black women can command more for their book advances than they could prior to Lovey. That's historic. It's just, it's just historic, right? Bottom line, if you're a Black woman and you want to get published by a major, you literally can make more today because of Lovey. That's historic. You got my man, Carl Loco. Carl Loco, his story, right, is he literally went from one of the most notorious gang members in the United Kingdom. And, and let me just underscore, I'm talking about this man started his own gang and what they did is they robbed drug dealers. That's how savage and ruthless Carl Loco was, right? Son of, you know, Brixton. And you fast forward 20 years, he's completely changed his life around. He's friends with the royals. He went to Prince Harry and Meghan's wedding. He's close friends with the Bransons. And he's not just friends with these folks. He does and facilitates business. When we talk about influencers today, a lot of people think about who's posting up on Instagram, right? You like that's what the word influencer has become someone who has a big following on social media. That's what influencer has become. No, there are true influencers operating in what I call the shadows, facilitating big transactions. And Carl Loco is one of those folks. Then you have Neville Garrick. Neville Garrick. If you listen to that episode, you'll see that he doesn't even, he, he won't even allow me to call him a legend. But I mean, let me just say this is because of Neville Garrick's ideas, he came in and reshaped Bob Marley's brand. Literally. Bob before Neville Garrick, Bob Marley was really focused on reading the Bible and really focused on conveying everything he knew about the Bible. When Neville Garrick got involved with Bob Marley, Neville said, you know, we should introduce the black power movement. So therefore we could start to educate by stealth. So then Neville Garrick started to create backdrops. No one had done backdrops before Neville Garrick. He would create backdrops of Haley Selassie or Rastafari, right? So that when Bob Marley's on stage singing, who by the way, at that time, a lot of people don't realize Bob Marley was singing only to white college audiences. That's who was rocking with Bob. Let's let's make sure that let's make sure that we understand this. White in the 70s, in the early 80s, before Bob Marley passed away, black people, in particular, black people in the United States, they weren't messing with Bob Marley. They thought it was hippie music. They they were like, no, 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 that's not us. Let's remember that. Let's remember that, okay? Neville Garrett came in and he said, no, let's change the message. Let's change the brand. 
And I think it was Neville Garrick. This is my opinion. This is my analysis. I think it was Neville Garrick through his messaging. It, it connected Bob. It solidified Bob really with the black community as well as white communities. And this is the reason why I believe Bob Marley has remained to be one of the most influential and successful artists is because when you listen to his music, you could hear its messages of empowerment, right? Free, all, Zimbabwe empowered itself almost off of Bob Marley alone, right? So let's remember Neville Garrick, incredible part of history, all right? Then, my man Ron agrees. Okay, there you go. There you go. And then here's the next part. Nana Kwame Bediako. I'm curious. In the chat, like who who had who has heard of Nana Kwame Bediako prior to the podcast? I'm curious. Who has heard of Nana Kwame Bediako before the podcast? Cuz I want to say this. This is somebody that we must be talking about. He just turned 40 years old. Within 17 years, he's built nearly a billion dollar empire, but he's doing it as a, phil uh, he, he's, he's doing it, he, he, he's got a, you know, he's doing his uh, philanthropy, but what he's also doing is he's teaching people how to create wealth. He's not just building businesses, but he's teaching people how to create wealth. Incredible story. By the way, when he was, at university, he made over a million pounds. Boom, put the million pounds in a bank. How many people do you know have, have done that? I don't know anybody. Well, should I say, I don't know anybody who's done that legally. At 17 years old, saved up enough money from your own business hustle to put a million in the bank? What? This is what this guy was doing, right? This is what this guy was doing. We need to be talking about this. This is interesting. I just, you know, so so I see that everybody's saying they've never heard of him, never heard of him, never heard of him, never heard of him. This is the reason why I do this podcast. Now, I'm about to say something that's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, all right? It's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. We've never heard of Nana Kwame Bediako, right? But who have we heard of? Uh, we all know Gary Vaynerchuk. That's right. That's right. I'm going there. I'm going there. We've all heard of Gary Vaynerchuk. We've all heard of Mark Zuckerberg. Shout out to Mark, right? Because of you, we're, we're streaming on, on a bunch of platforms. We've all heard of Bill Gates. We've all heard of, uh, you know, Steve Jobs. We endlessly hear about these entrepreneurs. But in my opinion, there's a massive difference between studying those entrepreneurs and studying these entrepreneurs, if you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you a visual. Let me give you a visual because I'm going there today. I'm going there today. You see this? You see who this is? This is, Man actually, Somebody tell me who this is, because I'm about to I'm about to say something that's going to upset a lot of people right now. But I'm but I'm going to say it. So. This is a photo or three photos of Manute Bull from Sudan, one of the tallest NBA players to ever play the game. Seven foot seven. He could literally just hold his hands up and dunk. One of the few basketball players who literally he doesn't have to jump. He just, you just throw him the ball and he dunks. You see where I'm going with this. Somebody, somebody tell me if you if put me in the chat, if you see where I'm going with this, that's Manute Bull. Then you have Muggsy Bulls right there. Muggsy Bulls, he was five foot three. Muggsy Bulls was one of the shortest NBA players to ever play the game. And if you were to throw him the ball, as you see him dunking, he can't just he can't just drop the ball in. This man's got to get a running start. He's got to hit his vertical right. He's got to time everything perfectly. Somebody drop me in the chat if you know what I'm about to say. Muggsy Bulls, Manute Bull. If you study 
Steve Jobs, you study Gary Vaynerchuk, you study uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you study any of those folks, you're basically studying Manute Bull. That's what you're studying. You're studying Manute Bull. But if you study these folks that I just talked about, Nana Kwame Bediako, you study Lovey, you study Neville Garrick, you study Carl Loco, you're studying Muggsy Bulls. Now, let me ask you, who do you think we need to be studying? Who do you think we need to be studying? Because guess what? I don't know anybody else. I don't know anybody who's seven foot seven. You know what I mean? I don't know folks who you could just throw the ball and dunk. You see, those entrepreneurs, yeah, we can distill lessons from those entrepreneurs. But commonalities, they all had wealthy fathers. They all had inherent advantages that made it easier for them to conduct business. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have skill. Yeah, those dudes are, are crushing the game. They have skill. They have skill, okay? I'm not shading a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg or Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm not shading them, right? They still had to, quote unquote, get to the NBA like Manute Bull. But if I have to choose who I'm going to study, I'm studying Muggsy Bowles. I want to learn that. Why? Because Muggsy Bowles is playing against all of the, all every single disadvantage you could think of. He had to figure out a way to overcome. And if I want to be a successful entrepreneur and thought leader, I need to learn how to overcome every disadvantage. And by the way, this is the reason why it's so important for white entrepreneurs and thought leaders to study black entrepreneurs and thought leaders. Can I pause for that real quick? Can I, can I do a pause for the cause real quick? This is why it is incredibly important for white entrepreneurs and white thought leaders to study black entrepreneurs and black thought leaders. You know what's interesting? Ever since I dropped Better With Paul, when I drop Better With Paul, if I drop a video, and you can tell me right now, if I drop a video, you could go look at the comments. Go look at LinkedIn, go look at Instagram, go look at Facebook. My following on all of my social platforms is pretty much half. It's 50% white, 50% black. But why do you think it is? Let me ask you, let me keep, let keep it real. Why do you think it is every time I post, okay, let me post on Nana Kwame Beriako. Let me post on uh, Neville Garrick. Let me post on Lovey. Like, every time I post on these folks, it's rare, rare that anyone white will comment or like or share. And this is, this. go look at the data. The data is there. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? I'm just curious. Why do you think that is? Now, here's the larger point for me. I'll, I'll let y'all tell me why, right? But here's the larger point for me. The larger point is that I believe pop culture hasn't figured out that there is excellence in black entrepreneurship and there is excellence in black thought leadership. I don't think the world has really grasped this. The world hasn't grasped that we as black people are pretty much freaking Muggsy Bowls. And we still get to the NBA. And we still dunk the freaking ball time and time again. So young white entrepreneurs, young white uh, 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 people who want to be thought leaders, I'm going to tell you what, keep studying the Gary Vaynerchuks and all those people. But guess what? If you really want to leapfrog, know who Nana Kwame Bediako is. Know who Lovey is. Know who Carl Loco is. Know who Neville Garrick is. All right. That's all I'm saying. Let's get to this lesson because I'm too I'm too amped up right now. Right. Too amped up. All right. Let's get to this lesson real quick. Can we get to the lesson? Can we get to the lesson? All right. All right. There we go. We can get to the lesson. All right. So here's what I want to do. What I want to do today is I want us to look at these four entrepreneurs. I interviewed these four entrepreneurs slash thought leaders and watching them like I am a stalker. I'm just telling you all right now, I'm a stalker. And I 
observe everything, everything on every everything that they say, everything that they don't say with their body language. Uh, I observe to prepare for these interviews. I literally read or listened to probably seven to 10 hours worth of content just to prepare. So I feel like, you know, I'm an expert now on Lovey, Carl, Nana, and Neville. But what I want to do for you is I want to just unpack. Remember, that's what I'm trying to become world class at. I want to unpack four secrets to their success. These are four secrets that I don't even know if they know they have, right? I don't even know if they know they have these secrets. So I want to, I want to, I want to tell you like this, these are the keys. I want to give you the cheat code, right? This is the cheat code right here. I want to, I'm going to pull out four and I'm going to then really quickly teach you how to acquire those skills. Now we won't be able to do all, all of this in the next 30 minutes, uh, which, you know, I try to keep these to an hour. We won't be able to do this all in the next 30 minutes, but I'll at least be able to give you the resources for you to go after and do this yourself. And don't forget, make sure you get on the newsletter because I am going to share all of these slides and all of these resources from today, right here in the newsletter. So make sure you're on the newsletter. That way, you know, that way you can get it. All right. So now let me look at number one. All right. Let me, let me, let's, let's, let's look at, at, at number one real quick. All right. This is the first secret to the success of all four of these entrepreneurs. Now, now once again, these are four completely different entrepreneurs, different countries, different disciplines, different industries, different age, different, 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 but yet they have a lot of the same similarities. And that's what I like to keep an eye on. Where are they similar? All right, so now here's the first one. Task management, task management. Now, what in the, what is, what is task management? All four of these people are exceptional at task management. But what really is task management? Let me tell you my opinion of what task management is. Task management is when you can you can you can uh, I was going to use the word manage, you can manage. You can control a task from beginning all the way to the end. That's where a lot of us who want to be entrepreneurs mess up, right? You have to be able to control a task from the beginning all the way to the end. So that is the idea, that is the planning, that is the execution, that is the reporting. You have to be able to control a task from the beginning all the way to the end. Most entrepreneurs, now nah, they can't do a full task management. They just a little bit. Like, I, oh yeah, I'm just good at the idea part. Oh yeah, I'm just good at the planning part. Oh yeah, I'm I'm just good at the execution part, right? Oh yeah, I'm just good at the reporting and follow up. No, no, you have to be able to do this from beginning until end. Now, let's look at for each of these. I have a, a quick story, and then I'm going to share, of course, how you can develop the skill. This is Nana Kwame Bediaka. This is him in Ghana giving out supplies recently because he's a big uh, philanthropist, right? Now. He was the first person to articulate to me task management as a skill that he had. Because I was curious, when he was eight years old, he created a chicken farm that was successful. Then when he was 17, he created a, a business that did over a million dollars. Then he had no money, he went to Ghana. In 17 years, he created a business that does over a billion. And then on top of it, this guy, he, he has, I mean, he has, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees, right? And I'm trying to figure out how is it that he's able to do all of these things? And what I realized is that he is obs obsessed over each task. A lot of people will say that's what a micromanager is, right? 
And I will say this, each one of these entrepreneurs, that's exactly what they are. They're micromanagers. Every single piece of the task, they are a part of. Every part of the task, every part, right? With Lovey, right? She was a part of the designing of her book. Neville, he didn't just say, hey, you should do a backdrop. He was painting the backdrop, right? Carl, Carl, when he is running an event, even to this day, he doesn't have an assistant go to run the event. He actually goes and contacts everyone. They are obsessed. They are micromanagers. We have to, if you want to become uberly successful as an entrepreneur, you can't just delegate. You know, everybody likes to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you just delegate that. Once again, Muggsy Bowls, Minute Bowl. We don't have the resources just to go delegate everything. Come on now. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just go hire an assistant. Who really has assistant money right now? You know what I mean? So therefore, you have to micromanage each process, each part of the process. Now, this is the interesting thing. This is it. How do you actually become great at task management? This is, this is, th these are my suggestions on how to do this. The first is reduce your promises by 50%. What does that mean? That means, you know how we hear UPOD, UPOD, under promise, over deliver? This is basically what this means. But I am, I'm being very serious about this. Reduce by 50%. So what does that really mean? What that means is if you say to yourself, it's going to take me two weeks to do something and you commit to someone, yeah, I'm going to get that to you by August 15th. Let's say August 15th is two weeks away, right? No. You make sure you've underpromised by 50%. So that means you would have to double that. So instead say, no, I'm going to get it to you by August 31st, right? Or the end of August, whatever it may be. The point is that even though internally you believe you could hit August 15th, don't publicly say that. Publicly say, no, it's going to be the end of August, right? I want you to always reduce what you are saying by 50%. If you say someone hires you and says, hey, I need, um, you know, how many words can you write for this blog post? And you say, you know what, I, 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 in your mind, you say, I think I could write a thousand words. So you tell them, I could write a thousand words. I could write a thousand words. No, no, no. Don't tell them that. Reduce what you were saying by 50%. So instead, tell them you could write 500 words and then deliver a thousand words if, if, if that's what they want, right? If, if that will impress them. The bottom line is you have to truly manage the, the delta between your mind and your mouth, right? I've never said that. I like that. The, the different, right? The delta between the difference between your mind and your mouth. Our mind is thinking we could do everything. You can't do everything. So just reduce it in your mind, intellectually reduce it. And then your mouth will say less. All right. So this, 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 that's, that's part of it. The second part is this is you have to prioritize and you have to understand that you just can't do everything. This is the big this is one of the biggest things I've learned from interviewing entrepreneurs over the years. And this is something that I've adapted to my business and how I approach entrepreneurship and thought leadership. Every day, I literally write a list. Actually, let me show you. This is this is bad, but on a little piece of paper, I'll have like three things. Email so and so, determine this, leave a voice note. I, I, I normally just have like three things. Every day, I just identify three things. I mean, I'm, I'm running like five different businesses. I have two television shows. One debut, uh, shout out, one debuts next week on Monday, right? There's a lot that's going on. But every day, I'm just on three things. I've prioritized. I've said there are three things that I can do to instrumentally move my business forward today. I would like to do 10. I'd like to do 15, but I'm going to prioritize and only pick the top three. And at least I'm going to make sure I do the three. And then everything else, I understand it may not happen. It may not happen. And I'm good with that. <laughs> Vasu says, Virgos and our list. That's right. That's right. We all have lists as Virgos, right? But what I'm saying here, though, is let's all be Virgo-like. Identify your three things. 
and then everything else except it may not get done. And that's okay because you're focused on the big things that will help to propel your business. And then here's the last thing. Over communicate. Now, I want to I want to call out all of my mastermind mentees right now. I want to say something about my mastermind, which, by the way, I love my mentees. I love my mentees. We have one hundred and thirty mentees in our in our current cohort. And we are halfway done. A matter of fact, we have our, our, our midterm session tomorrow. Now, I want to I want to illustrate something that happened. And I knew it was going to happen. I told told my wife this. So every single mentee in the mastermind had a midterm strategy plan that they had to write. This was a hardcore strategy plan. If all any of the, the mentees that are watching right now, you could tell, you, you admit it was hard, right? It was hard. It took everyone weeks to write, weeks to research, weeks to write. It was hardcore. I said people were popping bottles, drinking afterwards when they submitted, right? That's how hardcore it was. Now, here's the part of task management that we know we should do, but we rarely do. And this is the reason why you have to over communicate. I told Jill, I said, you know what? It was due. I think that it was due last Friday. It was due on the 17th. I told Jill, I said, watch what's going to happen. Right on the 16th, the day before, we're going to start to get messages from people who can't deliver on the 17th. And then on the 17th, on the day that they're supposed to deliver, we're going to get messages from people who say they can't do it. And then we'll get even more messages from people the day after on the 18th and the 19th, right? Saying that they were late. What do you think happened? What do you think happened? That exact thing happened. Now, here's, and this is me talking to my mentees right now in the cohort. I love you, right? But this is poor task management. It's poor task management. In task management, you wanna over communicate. So, the more appropriate thing would have been the moment that you know you're going to be late. Even if that's the day I assign you the task, even if we're two weeks before you owe it, that's when you should say, oh man, just so you know, I'm going to be late. And going back to this point of reducing promises by 50%, maybe you say, I'm going to be late by three days, but then you get it in only a day and a half late. You see what I mean? Over communicating is important in task management because when you over communicate, every task is, a, is connected to someone else or connected to something else. Every task is an action that creates something else that allows people time to manage, to, to maneuver. For me personally, I only had a certain number of days to grade all of the, 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 uh, the strategy plans. So now, because a lot of the plans were late, I have to now shift my schedule, which then creates another problem, which then creates another problem. You see what I mean? But if the over communication happened, then I would have been able to shift accordingly. Now, the point is this, when you are managing, when you are managing, you wanna over communicate. So this is number one. If you want to become a successful entrepreneur, this is, this. you must be a task manager from beginning to end. If you are not, you can't be. You just can't be successful unless daddy is going to buy you a business or daddy is going to invest in your business. But if you are out here grinding and you don't have that support, you must be a beast at micromanagement. Okay? Next up. Next up is this. This one blew my mind. This blew my mind. Every single one of the entrepreneurs who I have interviewed, right? We're talking about Lovey, Carl, Neville, and Nana. They are exceptional at data analysis and making accurate predictions. What does that really mean? What it means is simply this. They know how to forecast. And I want to say this right now. And I, I want to and hope everything that I'm, I'm saying is sincere and from the heart. I believe this is the single most important characteristic 
of entrepreneurs who achieve massive success and moderate success. This is my opinion. I believe an entrepreneur's ability to forecast is the biggest characteristic difference between those who, who achieve massive success and minimal success. Now, this is the reason why I love doing this with you, because quite honestly, I've never heard, I've never seen anybody write this. You know, I read everything, Entrepreneur, Forbes, HBR, right? All these stuff. I'm sure it's out there, but I don't hear people talking about forecasting. I believe this is where it is. If you want to become great at business, you have to become great at forecasting. Now, think about when Wayne Gretzky said, you know, it's about skating to where the puck is going to be opposed to skating to where the puck is, right? Here is what we have to do. We have to figure out where the puck is going, right? Where our industry is going. And we have to be able to then predict where it's going and then where it's, you know, based on where it's going, how to build solutions for that. That's exceptionally hard. And let me ask you this. Do you believe, so this, this is a skill called super forecasting. This is an actual, this is an actual thing. There's a theory called super forecasting. Put yes or no in the chat if you believe you can be trained to super forecast. See, look at this. Look at this. Look, look, yeah, look at it. Yeah. If you could be trained to super forecast, do you yes or no? Do you think that's something that you could you could actually be trained to do? Because 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 let me just say this. I I truly believe most people are, are good. I'm getting a lot of yeses. Most people believe, no, I, I can't really be trained. But let me tell you this: not only can you be trained. I'm going to show you the book. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to give you the book that I believe when I say give you, I'm going to give you a link to the book. I'm not buying y'all books, right? You get a book, you get a book. No, no. I'm going to show I'm going to give you all the link to 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 talk about this. But let me tell you why this is so important, all right? This is Lovey, right? This is Lovey and this is this is Lovey doing her TED Talk. Now, Lovey's TED Talk is at over 5 million views and it's considered to be one of the most impactful, powerful TED Talks ever. That's substantial, right? I mean, you think about that. Think, I mean, think of how, how many people have done TED Talks and her TED Talk is considered to be one of the biggest of all time. So in the interview I asked her, I was like, Lovey, so when you look at your career, what was the biggest moment, right, of your career. And I thought she was gonna say the TED Talk. She was like, no, 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 no. The biggest moment of my career was actually the book, my first book, which she's working on a second book, but I'm judging you, right? Her first book, that was the biggest moment in her career. Now, that first book went on to currently, it has sold over 100,000 copies over 100,000 copies. Now, I don't want to count her coins, but let me just say she has made quite a massive sum of money on this book, right? 100,000, you do the math. But now, this is the interesting thing to me about her book and how it connects with Lovey's ability to super forecast is that what entrepreneurs entrepreneurship is like roulette you have to know where you're going to put your money down on. What are you putting your money down on? And then you have to double down and focus on that. I believe most entrepreneurs don't really know. They're fuzzy. Oh, I don't know where I should really focus. I don't know what I should double down on. And because of that, they have no conviction. But when you talk to entrepreneurs who have conviction, it's because they know with certainty what the industry, where it's going, and what is needed. When Lovey was putting together her book, she didn't get the best book deal. As a matter of fact, on the podcast, I joked with her. I got a better book deal. I got paid like two to three times the amount that Lovey got paid on her book, right? And she has far surpassed, right? My book in sales, far, far surpassed it. But she didn't care about how much money she was getting. 
they gave her all kinds of b busted covers that she didn't like. So she had to go and she had to create her own team to, to, to change the cover. She's the one who put the lollipop on. She was like, it needs to be red. The PR wasn't right. She had she took her own advance money from the book and she doubled down and she put it in PR. Like she basically, and keep in mind, she didn't really have any money at this point. She doubled down. She, she basically bet on the book. She knew the book was going to change publishing. She knew it was going to change it. How was she able to predict that? Was that by, was that a fluke? What do you think? Was, was that a fluke? Was it just by happenstance that she knew her book was going to then change the industry and then it did change the publishing industry specifically for black women? Was that a fluke? No, it wasn't a fluke. Here's something, Lovey, if you were watching this or if you watched the replay, I'm gonna tell you one of your superpowers that I don't believe you know, sis. You are a super forecaster. You're literally a super forecaster. Neville, you're a super forecaster. Carl, you're a super forecaster. Nana, Kwame, Bediako, you are a super forecaster. And here's the, the here's here's the upside for all of us. We can all learn to forecast. And this is the book. This is, I think, the best book right here uh, by Tetlock. This is one of the best books on the planet to begin to learn how you can become a super forecaster. I believe I've trained myself over the years to become a super forecaster. I, I believe this, right? I believe this. The question is, do you believe you are a super forecaster? Do you know where the puck is going? And if you don't, let me teach you how. Let me teach you how to be a super forecaster. If you, if, if, this is the book, right? This is the book, but let me just give you a quick summary of the book, all right? These are the skills. Get ready to get a mind blow right here. These are the skills that Tetlock says in the book, uh, Super Forecaster. These are the skills, or should I say the characteristics that people who are super forecasters have. Top 20% of intelligence. So they're not genius level, right? And I'm not I'm not shading any of the guests because I'm putting myself in that. I don't, I'm not genius level, but yeah, am I top 20? Okay, I'll take that, right? Comfortable with thinking in guesstimates, right? Guesstimates, right? They have a personality trait of openness. A lot of people don't realize this. Openness is an indicator of intelligence. It makes sense. Think of all of the Trump fans. Think about that. Think of all the Trump voters. Close-minded, unintelligent. You see where I'm going with this, right? So you can see how the personality, openness, right, is 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 important. They take pleasure in intellectual activity. Who likes chess? Who likes crossword puzzles? Right? That's an indicator. That's an indicator. And this was interesting. They appreciate the uncertainty of seeing things from multiple angles. They like to see, they like to say, you know, give me all the facts. Give me all the facts, right? Let me see it all. And they distrust their gut, which this is what I found interesting is because I've honestly always not fully believed in my gut. Drop me in here real quick. If you've not always, because you know, we're always told you shouldn't go with your gut. You feel your gut, right? Your gut tells all, your gut tells all. And honestly, I never always felt like my gut was right. I would always question it like, uh, is it right? Is it right? Well, guess what? If that's you, you might be on your way to becoming a super connector. I mean, not a super connector, a super forecaster and a super connector, right? Now, look at these. Here's some more right? They're not necessarily humble, but they're humble about their specific beliefs, right? Do you think that's me? Because here's the thing. I just said, yeah, I'm top 20% intelligence. As I, as I get older, it's interesting. People are like, Paul, you're not the most humble person I know, right? But when it comes to my beliefs, yeah, may, maybe so. Maybe so. 
they treat their opinions as hypotheses, right? So in other words, they're not saying whatever my whatever my opinion is 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 the final. No. They're saying it's whatever my opinion is is it's my opinion right now. It could change. You could sway me, right? You could sway me. And then then they constantly attack their own reasoning. They are aware of biases and actively work to oppose them. And then here's the last one I want to make sure that I emphasize is they are Bayesian. What is that? Is that like when uh, when Tiger Woods says he's what he was complination? What, what would Tiger Woods say? He's complination, negroation. What, what did Tiger Woods say he was? I forgot what he said he was. Right? Is what what is what is Bayesian? What is that? Is that like black and Asian? What in the world is Bayesian? Right? I, I of course had 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 to go down and research this. Is this is funny. You are Bayesian if you are someone who determines your theory, your opinion, based on probability opposed to based on what has been given to you, right? That's what Bayesian is. So let me give you an example so you know what Bayesian really is, right? If I told you, which I think I told you, I'm only going to do this live for one hour. I promise you, y'all, I'm only coming on for one hour. We're going to end by 1 p.m. EST. That's it. It's going to be one hour. If I told you that and you believed that, <laughs> first, I'm going to laugh, right? But if you believe that, that means you were like most people. You hear what people say and, and you, you, you believe it, right? You believe it. But the Bayesian, right? The B A Y. E-S-I-N, right? This is someone who focuses only on the probability. So if I were to say, yeah, I'm going to end this live within an hour. By 1 p.m., we're done. The Bayesian would have said, hold on for a second. Let me go to YouTube or let me go to LinkedIn, Facebook, and let me see all of the previous 30 lives that Paul has done. Oh, wow. Out of 30 live sessions, Paul has never once finished within an hour, even though he always says he's going to finish in an hour. Oh, my God. Therefore, the probability of Paul finishing in an hour is 0%. So even though Paul is telling me he's going to finish in an hour, there's no way he's going to finish in an hour. That's the Bayesian thinker, right? That is, that's the Bayesian thinker. That is someone who is judging, or not judging, someone who's coming to a conclusion based on probability, data, statistics, which is why I said it's about data analysis. Everything is about data. Everything is about data. So if you want to become great at becoming a super forecaster, here's what you have to do. It's real simple. If you want to become better, then you want to do your best to adopt all of those behaviors that I just mentioned. All those behaviors that I just went through, you want to begin to adopt these. What are those? You want to be focused on be being more open, focus on finding enjoyment in, in, in intellectual activity, get comfortable with uncertainty, question your gut, right? Don't be extreme left or extreme right. Understand that there's fact in both on both sides. Treat your beliefs as a hypothesis, right? And then also be Bayesian, right? Be Bayesian. Right. This this is very important. This is very important. All right. Now, let's go. We only have two more, y'all. Only have two more. Here's the next one that I pulled from these entrepreneurs. Ooh, unequivocal belief in yourself, the solution, and the movement. This is so important. How many of you watching this, even if you're watching this on the replay, Without doubt, I'm talking about 100% certainty, believe in your product or believe in what you're, uh, if you're a thought leader, believe in, you know, uh, uh, your predictions, 100% certainty, right? This is what I find interesting. I, I was talking to, um, I was talking to one of my mentees yesterday and she is, she, she's probably watching right now. She is brilliant. 
wickedly smart, top 20% easily, probably top 10% in terms of intelligence. And she has lots of ideas, lots of different business ideas. She's currently doing one business, but she's, you know, thinking about four or five other different, you know, business ideas. And I, and I've been, you know, working with her for some time. And I told her, you know what I think your biggest hurdle is your biggest hurdle. And I was telling her, but I'm telling you as well. Your biggest hurdle is that you don't have unequivocal belief in either yourself, your product, or the movement that you're in. Most people don't. Most people feel warm about it. Most people feel good about their self or good about their solution or good about their movement. But very few people unequivocally believe in themselves unequivocally believe in their product, unequivocally believe in their movement. And this is what blew me away about this man right here. This is one of my favorite photos. It's one of my favorite photos of Neville Garrick. So this is Neville Garrick, Bob Marley. I wish I knew the gentleman in the front. Much respect to you, sir. I don't know who you are, right? And this is, they're carrying Bob Marley's guitars up, 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 a you know, up a, uh, a staircase. Now, when Neville Garrick first saw Bob Marley live, he saw him on stage performing. Neville said he looked at him. A matter of fact, it was Neville, it was Bob Marley opening for, uh, 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 who was it? Uh, uh, Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye, right? And Neville Garrick saw Bob Marley standing on that stage. And he said the moment he saw Bob Marley, he knew he wanted to be part of Bob's movement. The moment that he saw him. And then Neville quit his job. So think about this. This is a man who, a Jamaican, and shout out everybody who is African, right, Caribbean knows this, is that if your parents sent you to school in the United States, and you came back to your country and you had a great job, which Neville had a great job. He was the editor, the photo editor at a newspaper. If you had a great job and then you quit that job to go hang out with a musician, what what what, what are your parents gonna do? Let me ask, let me ask y'all real quick. Really, to all the Africans and, and Caribbeans, if you did that, what would your parents do? For real. I'm I'm being I'm being dead serious. What would your parents do in that situation, right? Because let me tell you, let me tell you, this man, <laughs> yeah, it, it was like, they were like, yeah, what the hell are you thinking, right? Yeah, Kavan knows it. He would just lose his life. <laughs> like, plain and simple, he would just lose his life, right? Yeah, disowned. Lee was like, yeah, you'd be disowned. Yep, yep, yep. Ruse that, yep, he would just lose his life. Ru yeah, he just lose his life. Yeah, disown you, right? You're dead, Emmanuel. Yeah, exactly. See, th th there you go, right? The Africans and the West Indians, y'all know the deal. You would be done. Neville knew this, but despite that, he still said, I want to be a part of Bob Barley's movement. And on top of it, Bob didn't even give him a job. Bob didn't pay him. Think about this. Bob didn't pay Neville at first. Neville just got down. He just moved into 56 Hope Road. He just started, you know, drawing. He just started contributing to this movement. Think about that. Put yourself in Neville's space. This man had gone to school at UCLA. He came back. His parents are like, what the hell are you doing? And he moves in with this Rasta. At that time too, it was, it was crazy, right? Man, Rastas were getting, get, getting jacked up by the police in Jamaica at that, they're still getting jacked up by the police in Jamaica now, but they were getting jacked up, um, you know, at that time. What makes someone have that much conviction to unequivocally join a movement? What makes someone do that? Well, let me tell you, it's the same thing that Lovey did, the conviction that she had in her solution, her book. It's the same thing that Carl Loco had, the conviction in himself, to become the most influential person in Britain. The same thing that Nana 
Kwame Beriako had when he said, you know, I'm going to go to Ghana. I have no money. I'm going back to Ghana. But without question, I know I'm going to make it back a hundredfold. And he did. How do you get that conviction in yourself, in your product, in your movement? Here's my suggestions on how to do that. You got to believe in yourself more. This is one that we could spend a whole session on. But I just want to real quickly say this. You have to understand that belief in yourself, in your product, and in, your, in the movement is first understanding that you have the power. So many of us truly don't believe we have power over our circumstances. Instead, we believe our circumstances have power over us. But I'm here to say, I've read it, I've seen it, I've talked it, I've lived it. You have power over your circumstances. You have power over your circumstances. And it starts here. It starts here, right? This is why affirmations are so important. This is why mental uh, you know, gymnastics is so important. This is why surrounding yourself with people who are aspirational and inspirational and instructional is so important. This is why being part of this community, actually, this is a great time for a plug. Let me plug, let me plug something real quick. I like a good segue. This is why it's a good time to be part of the Better With Ball community, right? On Facebook. This is the reason why it's very important to be part of our LinkedIn group, right? We're it, like, th this is, it, it's about supporting it's about being around people who are going to be supportive. How'd you like that segue, by the way? That, how do you like that segue? I thought that was real slick. I should have put so much emphasis on it. I should have just been more smooth with it, but it's all right. It's all right. It was good timing. Timing was good. My execution was, was bad on the segue. But secondly, you want to determine and practice your superpower daily. This is something that I found to be really interesting about... Uh, my conversation with Neville. Let me ask you real quick. What is your, what, do you know what your superpower is? Do you know what it is? Because here's, here's, here's what you, you must do in life, right? You have to be on this constant quest to find out what your superpower is. And then whatever it is, you want to practice it every day. So for Neville Garrick, he was an artist. So every day he would create. He said something about Bob Marley. Bob Marley, I'll never, I actually never knew. He said, Bob was first and foremost. Look, look at me saying Bob, like, yeah, I know Bob, Bob, right? But Bob Marley was first and foremost a musician. Every single morning when Bob Marley woke up, he would have some bush tea, right? And he would sing, write music, and play an instrument. It wasn't always the guitar. He played lots of instruments, which I didn't even realize. Like Neville said that Bob Marley could play the hell out of the flute, which I, that's wild, right? That Bob Marley could play the flute. But the reason why is because Bob knew his gift, his superpower was he's a musician. And therefore, he practiced it every day, even at the height of his career. Even when he was in Germany dying of cancer, he was still trying to figure out how he could write music. He knew that was his superpower. What I implore upon you is to search for your superpower. And then when you believe you find it, practice it every day. My superpower that I'm developing is this. I wanna be able to unpack and teach. So I'm going to try to do this every day, whether it's a live, whether it's a podcast, whether it's teaching, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching, whether it is writing, I'm gonna practice it every day because I believe in five to 10 years, I, I, forget top 1%, I wanna to be top 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0001%, right? I wanna be number one. I can only get there by practicing the superpower. And then here's the beauty. The more you practice your superpower, the better your superpower gets, the more control you have over your circumstances. You see how that's connected? That's how you get power over your circumstances is you realize you have the skills to have the power over the circumstances. And then last but not least, map the steps between where you are and your goals. And then identify how you can control them. This is exactly what I talked about with my mentee yesterday. As I said, you know, 
if you want to gain more belief over your solution, more belief over your ability to control the success of your business, you have to map out all of the steps between where you are now and your goal, right? You want to create a website. You want to do a, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, marketing funnel. You want to create the solution, whatever it may be, right? And you want to then intellectually ask yourself, do you have the skills to do all of those things? Because guess what? If you have the ability to do all those things, you have control over the result. And if you have control over the result, you have control over the circumstances. See how it works? But my mentee, I knew when she started looking at the map, she didn't believe she could actually control each of the pieces. Therefore, she had uncertainty. Therefore, she didn't have unequivocal belief. You see how this, this works, right? Is that if you want that unequivocal belief, you want to, this is how you believe in yourself more. All right. Last question, last point, last of the four. Bam. This is, this, this is, oh man. See, see look, I appreciate that. See, this, see, I live, see, right now, I feel good. Honestly, you put a smile on my face. I feel good about that. I appreciate that for real. Much love, much respect. I appreciate that. So now here's the last one. This one got me. This one got me because I realize that when you are an entrepreneur, you're taking risk. But the question is how that risk sits with you because risk creates stress. How does that sit with you? Let me show you this. Now, this is real. This is real. This is Carl Loco with one of his gangs, because Carl Loco was an enterprising gang leader, so he had multiple gangs. So this is one of his gangs in South London back in the day. And one thing that Carl said in this interview that I'll never forget. So yeah, that's Carl Circle with, with the gun. Is Carl said how easy it was for him now to sit in the room with high powered people and make big decisions where multi, like millions of dollars are being moved across the table, high stress positions, uh, you know, high stress decisions. And I said, how? I, I was like, how? why is it so easy? And he pointed back to this. He said, Paul, when you have been in enough situations where people are literally pointing a gun to your head and you have to talk your way out of your head being blown off and you have to do that week after week after week, he said, you get pretty good at managing stress, right? And, 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 and when he said that, I thought, okay, we're all not going to be in this position, right? But what is it about his story and his characteristics? And what is it about the characteristics of the other folks that I've interviewed that allows them to be so chill? Because you all haven't seen the video. By the way, we're going to drop videos of all of these podcasts. But you know what's fascinating is every time they come on the podcast, Whoever it is, Nana Kwame Bidiako, right, Carl Loco, Lovey, Neville, they're smiling. They're smiling. And I point blank would ask them, how is it you, you're making so many stressful decisions? Everyone, you know, looking at your life, they think it's all, you know, glory. But I know what it's like. I know you've probably got challenges with cash flow. You have more money coming in, but you have a lot more money going out, right? I know you've got family that you're supporting now, right? I know the stress that you have. So I know it's hard to always put a smile on your face. So how is it that you're dealing with that stress? Here's my suggestion. Look at this. My sis Tamara says, cannabis is a great, you know, you know what's so funny about Tamara? This is how you know we're on the same, this is how you know this is my sis. You know why? Because look at this, look what slide I have. Here's one way to reduce your stress right here. <laughs> that is one way. That's one way to do it, right? And a lot of us joke like, oh yeah, yeah, ha 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 ha, like cannabis is a way to do it. But on the real, on the frill for real, 
if you get with someone like my sis here, who is an emerging thought leader in this space, you'll understand how to use cannabis appropriately to reduce stress, all right? Now, here's some other ways to reduce stress. Mindfulness and yoga. No exaggeration, and I've talked about this a little bit, but I'll just throw this out, you know, personal story, is, you know, my wife suffers from, you know, some, I call it mild anxiety, right? One thing that she has done consistently for the, for the last four months, I don't think she's missed one day doing it, is she does yoga and meditation every day, every day. And as a result, the anxiety levels, the stress reduction has come down dramatically, right? Next is surround yourself with chill and Bayesian people. Now, Bayesians are good, but Bayesian people, as we were just talking about, right? You want to be around people who are not uptight. You know, I see, I see it all the time. Most of the, like, like birds of a feather flock together. Most people who are stressed the stressed out, like you're running around with people who are stressed out. They're stressing you out. Get around some, get around the tomorrows of the world, right? Who are just chill. There are a lot of people who have a disposition of just chill, but then there's also people who focus on the data. They focus on the probability, right? This is one of the things where Jill, right? My wife says why we're good together. I am typically chill. 98% of the day. I'm chill. Even when the worst news hits. And trust, I mean, we're human. We've been rocketed by some of the most disastrous news. And Jill will tell you that when we get disastrous news, normally Jill will curl up in the bed, right? And not want to even get out of the bed. When I get the disastrous news, I say, all right, let's let's just be chill. Let's let's maybe let's let's have some coffee real quick. All right, let hold on, let's put on some music real quick. Like my my disposition is let's chill. Shout out to Aaron Hall. Very few people got that, but some of y'all got that, right? All right. And then I say, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the probability. Let's look at some of the things that we can control. You know what I mean? So now, get around those people. And then last is focus on what you can control and give up the rest to a higher power. All right? This is very important. I wrote about this in my first book about something I learned from Oprah, working with Oprah, is that I think one of her exceptional skills, because she's managing a massive empire, right? is her ability to just focus on the things that she can control. She realizes she can't control everything. She can't control, you know, exactly what people think of her. She can't control exactly how many people are watching, you know, her network. She can't con control exactly what the end product of the television shows. She can't control all of that. If you are consciously thinking about all of those things, you will go mad. She would go mad. Instead, she says, okay, 80% of this stuff I can't control, but 20% of it, I can control every bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to control the 20% and, and this is a very important and, and I'm going to give up the 80% to a higher power. Roy Baumeister wrote the book Willpower, which I believe Willpower is one of the most important reads of all for all entrepreneurs. And in the book, Roy Baumeister talks about how the common denominator between people who have the most willpower and people who have the lowest willpower is that the people who have the most willpower believe there is a higher power, whether that is God, Allah, the universe, whatever it may be to you, to me it's God, whatever it is to you, people who have the strongest willpower believe they are not the highest power, but there is a power above them. And if you believe there is a power above you, 
you have to believe that that power has some control over circumstance. And if you believe that that power has some control over circumstance, then it makes it easier for you to give it up. But to give it up to the higher power means you have to release it. If you're holding on to it, you're not giving it up. And that means you're not trusting your higher power. But if you can release it, you are trusting your higher power. And then you could fully focus on what you can control. I feel like we were just in church for a second. That felt a little church-like for a quick second. Didn't that feel like church? A little bit? Yeah, see, come on, yeah, just a little bit, right? So that's all I had, guys. Let me just recap it real quick for you. Here's the four, the four characteristics, right? Is that task management. You must become adept at task management. You must be great at assessing the data and forecasting. You have to be great at becoming unequivocal in the belief of yourself your product, and or your movement. And then you have to be able to manage stress because if you're an entrepreneur, you're constantly living in stress. So you have to understand how do you live with it. I want to make sure that you get on the newsletter. I'm going to send this slide deck to everybody who's on the newsletter. In addition, I'm starting all of these un this unpacking I'm starting now to unpack each of the uh, each of the the episodes, and I send out my opinion on you know on each person. So make sure that you're you're on the newsletter for that. And that's all I got. That's all I got. You know what's funny is I was going to do how I was going to do a Q and A if I finished in an hour, and you could see that I didn't finish in an hour because I never finish in an hour. But I'm okay with that because finishing in an hour is just a hypothesis to me. I could be proven wrong, right? <laughs> All right. So now, how was that, y'all? Kevin, I appreciate it, man. How was it? How was it? Keith said it was good. Kavan said it was good. That's what I'm saying. Sophie, my sis, good to see you, Sophie. I, so she's all about yoga, meditation, right? Uh, Leah said it was good. Uh, I appreciate it. My man, Jay, my man, Jay, I see my man, Jay. Uh, all right, guys. So I will see you all, you know, maybe we'll do this next week. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep popping on more frequently because I want to teach. I'm, I'm not going back to the two to three days a week. I'm not going to do that, but I want to do things that complement what we're doing with the podcast. So if you haven't yet, you know, if you haven't yet listened to all the episodes in the podcast, I encourage you to listen to every episode of this podcast. I promise you, I'm only I'm only publishing great content. And 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 and, and let me end on this: is I have recorded thirty plus episodes, thirty plus episodes, but I'm only dropping episodes that I believe are one level above excellence and are timely for what you need right now in this moment. So it's not fluff. The episode that's coming next week is about right now, today. And so just know that, like I'm, 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 I'm being conscious to, to never waste your time. I wanna make sure that when I show up, when you see me show up, you know, okay, Paul's getting ready to unpack some lessons. We're about to hear something that's gonna change my life or make me better. All right, guys, I'm done. Thank you very much. I will see you at some point. Goodbye.